Welcome to Hear God Every Day. I'm your host, Sarah Witten. Get comfortable, open your heart, and let's talk about how we can be more sensitive to God's voice in our everyday life. Welcome back. Uh, this word is a word of encouragement, specifically for those people who are maybe in a season of bad news, um, where you've either received some bad news or are fearing some bad news. Um, and this is a word of comfort and encouragement that the Lord spoke to me in kind of a bad news season of my own. And so I wanted to share it today. Um, but first, I just want to pray. Lord, thank you so much for your good news. Thank you, God, that you are so present in our season, that even in the times when we don't understand what's happening or the times when we feel like we're we're not hearing what you're doing or, or where you're going with this, God, that we can trust that your silence or your stillness is not an apathy response, but a response of confidence, a response of standing on what you already know and what you've already done. And so Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing and what you're saying so that we can stand and even be joyful. And in these in-between times or in these times in which um, it looks like things are not going to go our way. Lord, I just surrender this time to you, and I invite your Holy Spirit to just be here with us. Lord, I ask that you would be speaking to each and every heart exactly what you're needing to say to that person, because you are so personal and so present on each of our journeys. And so I just thank you, Lord, for this space in which we're turning our thoughts to you again and in listening for what you would say in the midst of whatever news we're getting. It's the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so there are two types of bad news, right? There's like actual bad news, something you're coming up against, something bad has happened or something that you're hearing about that's happened that's negative. Um, Or there's the imagined bad news, right? Um, Something triggers it. And all of a sudden in our minds, we're imagining, well, what if this happens or what if that happens or this is probably coming and we're having these negative imaginations about bad news that hasn't even happened yet. And no matter which type of bad news, real or imagined, we are struggling with or no matter which kind has been inserted into the middle of our day. They're just as powerful. And we're going to look in a minute at uh, Hezekiah and some bad news that he got and what the Lord did in it. And whenever we look at the Old Testament, we're not necessarily looking at those characters as examples for living, but we're more of looking at like, what did God do for them? Because that God is the same God that we're serving today. And we're also looking at what is God's nature? What is his unchanging heart towards his people that are following after him? And those things are going to speak hope into whatever we're walking through. So Hezekiah, um, we're in 2 Kings chapter 18, and it sets the stage by just talking about Um, Hezekiah. And it says this of him, starting in verse three, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He gave or he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him and he was successful 
in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. That is how they set the stage in describing who Hezekiah was. Basically, Hezekiah had testimony, right? He had experienced God's goodness. It said God was with him. God had given him success in everything that um, he had undertook. And in each of our walks, we can think back to or remember times of testimony, times when God has been with us. And had it not been for God being with us, we wouldn't have made it through. We can all think back to successes that happened that were definitely not by our own strength. We've experienced God's goodness, right? And then what happens to Hezekiah next is life starts happening, right? In this fallen world, there will be trouble, right? And so Hezekiah starts experiencing some of that trouble. First, what happens is, um, so in his fourth year, the Assyrians marched against Samaria and laid siege to it, okay? So they had deported Israel to Assyria. So all of the people were deported. And then it says they laid siege. And the very next sentence in verse 10 starts with, at the end of three years, the Assyrians took it. Three years, they were laying siege to it. And in times like that, where, you know, maybe we have been walking with the Lord and, you know, things have been going really well and we've been seeing a lot of movement in our life and a lot of breakthroughs, a lot of testimony. And then we hit this time that is just life. It's just trouble, right? It's like we have this amnesia of our testimonies. We know, okay, God came through that time, but wait, what about this time? right? Have you ever had a time like that? I know I've had seasons like this where it's like, God has literally done that same miracle in my life before. Yet when I come up against it again, I'm like, but what about this time? Will God come through this time? Hezekiah has seen so many victories of the Lord. And yet he comes up against the Assyrians this time and goes, is God going to come through? Is God going to come through? And I remember a time specifically before we moved into this home, um, a good friend of mine, I was talking to her on the phone um, and we had gotten words from the Lord about this specific house. We, We felt like this is where the Lord wanted us, but there were all of these troubles in the natural, um, that were coming against it. It looked like it wasn't going to be possible. And I remember talking to her on the phone and I was like, I, you know, I, I feel like, God wants us to have this. And I feel like this is what we heard, but like, I just don't know right now. And with complete confidence, she was like, Sarah, I know this is going to be your house. And I was like, well, how, well, why, how can you say that? And she was like, think about all the times that God has spoken something in your life and then done it. And she was right. I mean, there have been so many times where God has spoken something and been faithful. Despite the trouble, despite the in-between, despite the bumpy road, he's been faithful. And it's so easy to see that from an outside perspective, right? So my friend looking in was like, well, obviously he's going to come through because he he has come through for you and never failed you and come through time and time and time again. But when you're living it, it's harder to recognize. For us reading this about Hezekiah, we're thinking, well, yeah, of course God's going to come through because we have the ability to see from that outside perspective. It's not happening to us. And we're going, yeah, this is this is God who is with Hezekiah. We know how this is going to go, right? But it says it was three years of siege. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar with siege, but a siege is not like an all-out attack. And oftentimes that's the way we expect 
spiritual warfare to come. We expect the all out attack. The siege is when a city is surrounded and blockaded by an army that's attempting to capture it. And it's this slow wearing down. It's a slow deprivation of resources. And again, they're not launching an attack. They're actually waiting until that city gives up. And I know for me, there have been times of siege of the enemy where it's a time of waiting, a time of stretching or pressure. And in that time period where we are waiting on the Lord, the enemy is trying to turn that time period of waiting on the Lord into a time period in which we see it as deprivation and we see all of the enemy trouble surrounding us and we ultimately give up. That is the goal. And in this time for Hezekiah of all this external attack, all this external stuff from the enemy, this internal bad news starts brewing, right? Remember I talked about like there's the real bad news and there's the imagined bad news. Well, this imagined bad news inside of Hezekiah starts to come to play. And it probably sounded something like, I've done something wrong. I've lost the favor of the Lord. God is not with me. Something like that. And why do I say this? Well, because it says when they attacked the next time and they captured the cities of Judah, instead of Hezekiah going to God, he goes actually to his enemies and he says, I've done wrong. Withdraw from me and I will pay whatever you demand of me. And he pays them like richly pays them and even strips off the gold on the temple doors. He's thinking, I'm the why. I'm the why. God's no longer with me. I must have missed it. Somehow I missed it. And sometimes in that time of spiritual siege, we do the same thing. We let the enemy convince us, I missed it. Right. But actually, if we go back to verse 12 of 2 Kings 18, it says, This happened because they, not Hezekiah, he's talking about the people, they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated his covenant, all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. Okay. And this contrasts with what is said about Hezekiah. Hezekiah says he held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commandments the Lord had given Moses. Okay, so what was happening, we see in verse 12, is that he was living in a people that were wrapped up in sin. He was living in a fallen world, right? Hezekiah wasn't the why, but the enemy made him believe that he was. And we see from his response that his identity starts to get shaken. The enemy starts whispering lies to him about his identity and about his connection with the love of God. And in times of hardship, the enemy would love for us to believe lies that dislodge either our our identity or the identity of God. Like either believe that we are not favored or we are not who God says that we are or that God is not as good as he says he is. Now, like I said, we get the privilege of seeing kind of behind the scenes that it never says that God was against Hezekiah, right? Right? He was just in in this fallen world. But here's the hope, right? Despite Hezekiah's doubt and despite the people's unfaithfulness, still the Lord had planned his victory. Okay, so have you ever been so worn down in a season that you just say, like, I will give up whatever. Please just withdraw from me. Like, come on, whatever it has to take for the spiritual warfare to be over, I'm going to do it, right? So Hezekiah is in that place. We see him say, to his enemy, you know, withdraw from me. I'll pay you whatever you demand of me. Um, So I recently wrote an article about the wilderness times, and we notice how when the enemy comes in the wilderness, he brings the same kind of bargaining, right? So to the Israelites, he says things like, go back into slavery so that you can have meat, right? Like maybe you'll be slaves, but at least you'll be fed. Or make a golden calf so you don't have to wait on the Lord. 
or give up the promised land because, you know, it's filled with trouble anyway. It would be way too hard to conquer. Just give it up. And you can hear the undertones of the enemy in the same kind of way in the words of the field commander who comes to Hezekiah starting in verse 19. And this is what he says to him. He says, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says, on what are you basing this confidence of yours? Have you ever had the enemy say that to you? On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you're depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we're depending on the Lord, our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you're depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, I have come to attack and destroy this place, or have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Wow. The enemy comes and says, let me bargain with you. Let me provide a way for you to have strength or control, right? Verse 23 says, come now, make a bargain with my master. That word bargain, bargain is an exchange. It's a giving something up in order to get something. So essentially it's a compromise. The enemy is calling for a compromise and it's called a bargain. Anything is called a bargain bargain. When it is an advantageous purchase, especially one acquired at less than the usual cost. And so when the enemy is trying to bargain with you, when the enemy is trying to get you to compromise, it's because he knows what you have is way more valuable than any comfort or solution that is being offered. He knows he's going to get a bargain. What you have is way more valuable. The enemy knows that. He knows that what we have from the Lord is way more valuable. And if he can get us to see it as less valuable than whatever illusion of resolution he's offering, then we can choose to give up on our calling or on our breakthrough or on God's promises. And then the siege works. So Hezekiah was told, I'll give you horses to fight with, right? 2,000 horses to fight with. Now, horses back then, they were wealth, yes, but they were also war. Horses were how you fought. So he offers him 2,000 fighting horses. Now, you ready for this? God offers that they don't even have to fight. Okay, because spoiler alert, if you go further on in the story, in 2 Kings 19.35, it says, this is what the Lord ends up doing. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. Okay, so the enemy offers him, here's 2,000 horses to fight with. When God's plan was, no, no, you don't even have to fight. And I'm going to annihilate 185,000 of your enemies, way more than you could have fought on your own with. So in our own battles, right, we have this same kind of idea like, okay, you know, if I compromise, then maybe I can defend myself. Maybe I can fight for myself. Maybe I could kind of pull these resources together when in reality, God has got so much bigger and better of a plan than what we can attempt to do in our own power, what we can attempt to bargain for. So despite his shakenness at this point, Hezekiah had still been telling the people, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the the hand of the king of Assyria. All right. Have you ever been standing on a word when you start to look like a fool? Right. I remember. um, So when our daughter was born, uh, the Lord had told me beforehand that um, she was going to be like perfect, perfectly healthy. Um, and 
<laughs> when we were walking through the process, um, she was born and then they had concerns and then she was in the NICU. And then sure enough, um, before long, they're telling us either it's not if something's wrong, it's what is wrong. And she's either going to need heart surgery or she's not going to make it. And this whole time I'm telling them she's fine. She's fine. You know, come on, get us ready to go. She's okay. And I start to look foolish. Right. And I even start questioning, like I'm crying and I'm going, God, I know that you said this, what is happening. Right. And in the last minute, on, well, on the fifth day of this, you know, I'm totally worn down, but I'm still believing. And when we get to the hospital, um, they had done all the scans and they said, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with her heart. It's perfect. Um, and actually overnight, her numbers, her blood oxygen came up to 100 percent. So um, you'll probably be discharged within a day. Standing on the word when everything else looks to the contrary can leave you feeling kind of foolish if you forget the magnitude of what the Lord does for his people that stand on his word. So for Hezekiah in verse 31, the enemy continues and he's talking to the people. Now he says, don't listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he's misleading you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim, Hena, and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had had commanded, do not answer him. I love that ending verse, that verse 36, the king had a command to do not answer him. And so the people remained silent. Um, so about a month ago, it was our daughter's fifth birthday and, um, she had gotten a bike and it was this little unicorn bike. Right. Um, and our two and a half year old boy <laughs> decided when we're loading it in the car, he wanted that bike. And so he's crying and saying, you know, he doesn't understand why it's not his birthday, even though he's saying himself happy birthday a million times, he doesn't understand why it's her birthday and not his. And he wants this bike, even though it's pink and unicorn and, um, he can't even fit on it anyway. And so, um, this argument starts happening between my five-year-old and my two and a half-year-old. And so she's trying to convince him like, no, this is my bike bike because it's my birthday. And he's trying to convince her, no, this is my bike because it's my birthday. And finally, I just say, Rory, that's our daughter's name. Rory, don't argue with him. You know the truth. And it was like, the Lord just hit my heart and said, you too, don't argue with him. Don't argue with the enemy. You know the truth. Don't argue with the enemy. You know the truth. Because the reality is oftentimes I'm sitting there arguing, well, this is how God could come through for me, or this is why, you know, this and this are not true in what you're saying. When the reality is God's like, don't even speak, don't even respond, be silent and stand on my word because you know the truth. Because as a parent, I knew he wasn't even going to be able to fit on that bike. He clearly wasn't going to take that from her. It definitely wasn't his birthday. Like I know that, that that's so obvious, right? To me and to, to Rory, but the temptation to stand there and to fight in these battles is still there, but don't argue with the enemy. You know, the truth. At that point, Hezekiah is almost ready to give up, says he's in sackcloth and ashes. And he says, this is the day of rebuke and distress. And he compares it to like an almost birth. Like it's this almost this deliverance, this glorious thing, but then not. So you can tell he's like getting kind of hopeless, but 
there's this tiny little bit of hope in him. It says in verse four, it may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives. It's like this little mustard seed of faith. And, you know, sometimes it's not always the size of our faith, but it's the size of our endurance. If we can have that mustard seed of faith, even through the years of siege, even in the face of all this stuff happening, that little mustard seed is enough. Because at that point, what happens is Isaiah, who's speaking on behalf of the Lord. He's a prophet for the Lord. So um, this is essentially God's answer. Isaiah, in 2 Kings 19, starting in verse 6, it says, it says Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. There's the title of this message. Do not be afraid of what you've heard. Don't be afraid of what you've heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country and there I will have him cut down by the sword. Okay, so it outlines this like little kind of four part instruction that I feel like is for us as much as it is for him. So step one, do not be afraid of what you've heard. So fear often comes because either we're we're arguing with the enemy and we can't yet prove him wrong because the word hasn't come to fulfillment yet. So we're trying to prove him wrong when it's still this abstract thing in the future. We can't prove it yet. And we also can't protect ourselves in our own strength. And so, you know, fear kind of creeps in because we're going, well, and what we are tallying and all the assessments we're making, like we can't overcome this. And so that's the ways that fear creeps in. But the thing is, we were not meant to do either of those things. We weren't meant to prove the enemy wrong. That's God's job. We weren't meant to protect ourselves in our own strength. God's protecting us. And The beautiful part of what he commands, and when he says, do not be afraid of what you've heard, what you've heard, okay, heard is not seen. And nine times out of 10, the enemy wants us to be afraid of things we haven't even seen yet. Things that haven't happened, we've only heard it. He loves to plant these little ideas in our mind. And they're things that we'll never see because ultimately the word of God is more powerful. But God says, don't be afraid of what you've heard. All right, step two, he says, listen. Now, if you have uh, kids or even a spouse, you know, sometimes hearing is not the same as listening, right? Listening is active. Hearing, you might hear the words, but listening, you understand. And there's a response that's elicited. So um, when my husband and I were were just dating, um, I had fallen um, off a ladder at work and dislocated my knee. And so it had been like a crazy day. Like the, the ambulance guys were like, oh, it's our first day, which is great. And then um, they load me in the ambulance and the ambulance, they it's like taking a long time. They come back in and they're like, um, well, we have a, a nail in the tire. So we have a flat tire. It's going to be a minute. So I'm sitting there and then they finally get me to the hospital and the hospital is like, yeah, I'm sorry. We're out of ice today, but let's just prop up your knee. It was the strangest like experience ever. But Um, in the midst of this, I'm calling, I call Garrett and, um, then I call my mom and my mom, you know, she's, she's mom. So she is like, all right, I'm on the way. Well, I call Garrett and I tell him like, yeah, you know, um, I'm like by myself here and it was kind of scary, this whole thing happening. And I really wish you were here. You know, he's like, oh man, yeah, I'm so sorry that that happened. Like, yeah, I can't wait to see you. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye. You know, and (laughs) just like hung up and he did eventually come to the hospital. But when he did, um, I was like, why didn't you come earlier? Like, why didn't you come sooner? And he was like, well, you didn't ask me to come. And I'm like, well, okay. So you heard what I said, but the difference was he, he heard what I said, but the listening to what I was meaning and the action behind it were not caught. And good news is it all worked out. We're still married. Marriage is beautiful. It was great. Um, but I could not but think of that when God is saying, don't just hear me listen, right? What would we be doing if we were not just hearing God, but listening, listening in a way that elicits an active response 
that's saying, okay, not only do I hear what you're saying, but I'm not hearing what you're saying. And then just sitting around, you know, on the sidelines as if it's not going to happen. I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm responding as if it's happening. Right. Okay. Step three eyes for the coming report. It says, God says, when he hears, when the enemy hears a certain report, you know what our report is? Our report is our testimonies. Okay. So there is a coming testimony that is going to make the enemy tremble. And so our eyes, instead of looking for the bad news, instead of looking for what the enemy is going to do next, our eyes need to be fixed on what is the coming testimony that is going to make the enemy tremble because there's this domino effect with testimonies, right? Um, I had a good friend who, um, was struggling with fertility and for years and years, you know, trying to have a baby and, um, I would pray with her and pray with her. And then by God's grace, um, she got pregnant and has this beautiful, amazing baby boy. And when I met another friend that was having the same struggle, I told that testimony, oh, you know, here's what the Lord did for my friend. And then she got pregnant. And then I was telling the testimony about both of those to a third friend who was trying. And then she got pregnant. And it was like this domino effect of when we see what God can do and does do in the lives of others, it just trickles in this miraculous outpouring of faith. And um, testimonies, cause that kind of reaction. And so the enemy trembles at our testimonies. And when the Lord is building a testimony through us, we're looking for, okay, what is the Lord doing? That's not just going to affect me, but that's going to affect many other people down that domino line. Because the truth is we take in a lot of testimonies every day every day. But often they're not testimonies about God, but they're testimonies about what could go wrong, right? We're getting our testimonies from the news or we're getting our testimonies from social media, or we're hearing about this horrible thing that happened or this bad statistic or whatever. And those are testimonies, but they're the bad kind, right? They're the testimonies of what could go wrong. Our daughter, she takes ballet and, um, she's, she's not, very graceful. Um, but you know, she, she has a lot of heart and so they're doing this one move, you know, and they're sitting on the ground and she's trying to be, be, I don't know. She, she said later, I asked her like, what were you doing? And she was like, I was trying to be a whale mommy. So she was being a whale and, um, she bonked her head on the ground, not hard. Cause she's, you know, sitting already on the floor. Um, but hard enough to like make a little bump. And so we put ice on it and, um, her teacher came up to me later. She was like, how's she doing? And I was like, Oh, she's okay. You know, she's got a little bump, but you know, she'll be fine. And, um, you know, she didn't hit that hard. And the teacher proceeds to tell me a story about one time in all of her years of teaching where a kid bumped their head and then later died. And afterwards I was thinking, Oh my gosh, like, why would you tell me that story? Because that's like, you know, I was feeling fine. And now this plants the seed of fear. And oftentimes we run into those throughout our life. It's like, we, we hear these outlier stories or we hear these crazy testimonies, but they're not about what God has done. They're about these like one-off bad things that could happen. Right. And so we need to be conscious of feeding ourselves testimonies of what the Lord is doing, because, you know, the enemy loves to, like he did to Hezekiah in verses 30, 33 and 35, he says to Hezekiah, he says, has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? And then he says, who of all gods of these countries has been able to save this land from me? Like basically, hey, look at the stats. When has God ever come through against me in a situation like this? And if Hezekiah had looked at the statistics, he would have been totally hopeless, right? When we look at the statistics, when we look at how often has this happened, then it robs us of the faith for God to do what he wants to do. Like what if God wants to do something in your life that looks nothing like anything that you've ever compared it to? What if Moses looked for proof in his peers that it was possible to do all that God called him to do? Like who in the Bible has a normal story? right? Like nobody. And we're told to run our race, just our race. Like we can't be looking to the right or to the left. Um, you know, we used to drive around in college with some of our friends and we had this like inside joke because one of our friends would always point out things on the side that like, Oh, do you see that over there? Or, Oh, look at that beautiful sunset. But then she'd say, Oh, don't look, you're driving. 
you know, look at that. Oh, don't look, you're driving because it's true when we're driving or running and we're looking in a certain direction, we start to move in that direction. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to say, Hey, look over here, look over here, because then we'll start to steer that way. This race, the only place we're supposed to be looking is to the author and perfecter of our faith. We're supposed to be looking to Jesus. He is our blueprint. He essentially in this race passed us the baton. And what we know is everything that was abnormal about Jesus's life, his dreams, visions, healings, deliverance, like Holy Spirit, ministry of impossible love, all of those things, they are a blueprint of what is ours to continue. And so what kind of reports is the enemy about to get about what God did through you? What report do we focus on? So the last step, step four, God said, Hezekiah, I need you to listen for my report. But then that next line says, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country and there I will have him cut down by the sword. God is speaking here. God is saying, I will conquer it with the sword. And the sword is his spirit and the sword is the word of God. And so we're not praying, God, please help me conquer it. Please help me figure it out. Please bless me as I do it myself. You know, that can be one of my favorite ones. We're asking God, what are you speaking over the situation? What is your report? And we're believing that. And we're watching for God's word to be victorious. Because just like Hezekiah, While Hezekiah had done a lot of great things for the Lord that it mentions, and we love to think like, if we just do enough great things, then that'll earn our victory. I think it's beautiful that God's victory for Hezekiah came while he was sleeping. He couldn't and wasn't doing anything except for standing with that little mustard seed of hope on the word. And then while he slept, with his little faith, God went out and God annihilated his enemies. Don't be afraid of what you're hearing. As we close today, I just want you to take a minute with the Holy Spirit and ask, what is your report? The enemy might be trying to fill your head with a lot of reports, but what is your report, Lord? Ask him, to what situation in my life are you saying, don't be afraid? Listen to me. I'll cut it off with the sword of my word. God, we thank you for fighting our battles, especially the battle for our minds and for our hope. So, Lord, I just pray that you strengthen us in hope, strengthen us in uh, your word and in the knowledge of who you are. And we thank you, Lord, for the coming victory that is more than anything that we could do by our own strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for spending time with me today. If God spoke to you through this time, visit arrowsofzion.com for writings, resources, and ways to partner with me in reaching the unreached with the gospel. You can also find Arrows of Zion on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Have a blessed day, and let's meet here next week.